Let me reframe my question. If 2014 was clearly a vote for change, an exit of a Congress government mired in corruption, 2019 was clearly a national security election coming in the backdrop of Pulwama and Balakot. There hasn't been that one issue that ties or, or defines this election, not even Modi himself, not even Modi himself, right? So the opposition has argued that this is like a series of local elections, not one big national election. Does it feel like that to you? Certainly not. I disagree with you when you say that this has not been a, 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 an election with a single focus. This election from beginning to end has been about Narendra Modi, the leadership of Narendra Modi. The various issues have all been filtered through the personality of Modi, whether it's the question of governance, whether it's a question of Hindutva, or nationalism or the future. It's all been focused through the prism of Narendra Modi. So Modi is absolutely central to this. Now, my belief is that where Modi was uh, began life in 2014 in, at the, in, in the national stage as a sort of symbol of hope and resurgence, he became a symbol of uh, uh, nationalism, national resurgence again in 2019. And now it's more than that. He's become a cult and more. So it is very much centered on Modi. Whether you love Modi or hate Modi, it's Modi. Let, 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 me, let me explain what I mean. Uh, what I mean is that you don't see that kind of... Firstly, he's familiar. In, 2000 and, in 2014, he was, this, he was an outsider. He positioned himself as that, an outsider to the world of Delhi. In 2019, he was this sort of alpha leader who had taken the sort of Balakot response in response to Pulwama. In 2024, he's familiar. He's much more familiar. He's much more known. But in what's being called an election without a wave, there's certainly no visible uh, anger against him. Uh, there is a lot of goodwill for him. He remains a dominant political force. But there isn't that kind of hysterical wave type over expression of sentiment. That's what I meant by saying that there isn't any one emotive issue that ties the election nationally. Would you would you agree with that? Well, I think part of that, I mean, you're, you're right in the sense that if you're going to judge uh, and this 2024 election through the choreography of previous elections in the 90s or something like that, it's very different. One of the reasons is, of course, it's a, it's a very long election. It's also an election which is ex in an extremely adverse weather, which is there. But more than that, I think the big public meetings which were a feature of India, you know, 20, 25 years ago, that has ceased. Now the public meetings are more, they're still not like Western Europe where people are, you know, in, 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 herded into a hall. But it's, it's far less in terms of attendance, in terms of outward expression of emotion. But whatever little I've seen, it's very, very clear that Modi, still draws the same amount, uh, has the same amount of appeal. Maybe the visible expression of it is different. And actually, whether it's a wave or not is something which inevitably, even if you go back to the media ports of 1984, you'll find that nobody discovered a wave even then. Every wave is always discovered in hindsight. And this wave, I believe, is also going to be discovered in hindsight. But... This is going to be an election which is really another referendum on Narendra Modi. That's interesting. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the folk focus on his speeches. There's been a lot of debate around them. And today we have the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in the context of appealing to the people of Punjab. He accused the Prime Minister of lowering the dignity of, of, of the office. He said that no other Prime Minister minister had used the kind of language that Prime Minister Modi has in this campaign. He called them divisive hate right. speeches. Now, I want to ask you why you think the Prime Minister felt the need to bring in Mangal Sutras, why you think he felt the need to bring in uh, a reference to a community that has more children. Later in an interview, he said, I never meant Muslims. You all assume I meant Muslims. But he did say the Congress wants to take property and give, give it to Muslims. In that speech, he did use words it was not like the Prime Minister's speeches in the last elections. There is a sense, some people suggest that maybe he was jittery about turnout in the first 
who says this, so he fell back on polarization. How did you see the, that speech and how do you see Dr. Manmohan Singh? Well, first for Dr. Manmohan Singh. Well, Dr. Manmohan Singh was a prime minister. He was the accidental prime minister who never uttered a political word in, throughout his entire career. He was never set out to campaign in a polit- in, in an actual election. So his certificate on how to conduct an election is probably as good as my uh, having giving a homily on at, at the on nuclear science. It just doesn't fit in. Manmohan Singh and politics are in are completely poles apart. At least as far as election hearing is concerned, for a very long time. We have, we, because okay. of those 10 years what about the comments themselves? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, no, no. I, yeah. I'm, I'm saying go ahead. Manmohan yeah. Singh was not into the political game at all. He was never the Congress star campaigner, even the time he was prime minister or when he was the leader of opposition in the Rajya Sabha, etc. Man, Mr. Modi has always, and this is a point which all of us who've seen Mr. Modi campaigning from will tell you, is always a very, very pugnacious, aggressive election uh, campaigner. He always goes for the jugular of the opposition. And in this case, he went for the jugular. Now, you might say that his use of the, and it's only that one speech which has been brought out. You know, otherwise, you know, throughout the campaign, it's a very long campaign. He He's given, I think, you know, about 500 speeches and he's given about 75 interviews, much more than he's ever done anything. So in, in his entire career, probably, Man, Mr. Modi has been very focused in actually making sure that the main point that the BJP needs to be re-elected because there is a vision in front of him, because there is a uh, the, the, in the future of India depends quite a lot on it. So he has never deviated from that. And as far as that and the question of uh, the inheritance tax, which was concerned, you know, it was also linked with this thing that the Congress was explicitly opposed to the uniform civil code and that's there in its manifesto they cannot renege from that so that was quite conveniently in a very polemical sort of way interpreted by mr modi as these the people are for sharia and then again a loose comment on redistribution was again used by saying these people want to read it, take away your property he linked it up with uh, it, that, that was a bit of a slate of hand. He linked it up with this thing about the first claim on the on the resources of India, the earlier statement by the speech by Manuman Mohan Singh. He made that. And it was a one-off speech. After that, you cannot say in any way that there has been a single speech of Mr. Modi where he's talked about Muslims as a community. Yes. He's spoken about infiltration, which is a live, real live issue in places like Assam and West Bengal. He has spoken about that. He has spoken about the culture of appeasement, which is also a live political issue. But these are legitimate political issues which have to be taken. You cannot cover up the fault lines in society. I'm not saying you can actually attend, you know, resolve them, but you, you cannot cover up the fault lines in society during an election campaign by saying, no, no, you must be absolutely sanitized in your thing. You must be like Dr. Manmohan Singh when you give an election. No, 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 look, 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 the prime minister or, or any politician has every right to, to polemically use fodder provided by the opposition. But, the, but, but to link or to equate infiltrators with Muslims, right? Gospetti and Muslims to use phrases like vote jihad, which has now entered the lexicon. That's well, what the so vote been. jihad was a phrase which was coined innovatively by a Congress lady from Farukabad, someone who's as PLU as you and me, probably. Hmm. And, and the reference to the community that has more children, but she later said, I didn't mean Muslims. Well, that's a way. I mean, I think that uh, was an unfortunate expression. I, I would say that it was not necessary to that. But as far as concerned, as far as the infiltration question is concerned, one of the reasons why a lot of politicians 
are very indulgent and permissive towards this infiltration of Rohingyas, for instance, in, into Bengal, is because they happen to be from a particular community, they happen to be Muslims, and they, they bolster and reinforce a, a, a vote bank which has been built on the basis of religion. And again, the question of uh, reservations of Muslims. Very recently, the Calcutta High Court struck down the OBC, the entire OBC reservations which have been there in Bengal on the ground that it had actually brought in Muslim reservation under the guise of OBC reservation. So these are real issues, Barka. We can always, I know these are issues which don't necessarily uh, appeal to, to the aesthetic sensibilities of you and I or people when we are sitting down in a genteel sort of fashion. But unfortunately, India is a harsh place. India, sometimes the issues are very uh, ragged, jagged, I'm sorry. And, and, and they, uh, they probably, uh, it will probably take us another 50 years when we can get to a position where, you know, we can each issue out a, a pamphlet and say, this is my political appeal and go and vote for it. 